Crazy Over Horses by Marion Holland. Janie's body sat in civics class, but her mind was far, far away. Automatically, her eyes followed the teacher's chalk across the blackboard as he drew three large rectangles and labeled them executive, legislative, and judicial. But Janie was back in the middle of the summer, back in West Hope with her cousins. Again, the gravel scrunched under her booted foot, and she and her cousins ran down the long drive from the house to the stables. Again, she saw Eddie, the stable boy, leading out the three shining horses, all saddled and ready for the early morning ride. Again, she heard Golden Sun, the tall chestnut she had ridden all summer, wicker a soft welcome as he pushed his nose against her shoulder and watched with wise, dark eyes while she reached in her pocket for the bit of apple. She could still feel on the palm of her hand the velvet touch of his soft lips as he nubbled the tibbet from her hand. More clearly than the squeak of the chalk on the blackboard, Jan could hear the muffled thud of hoofs as the horses picked their way down the narrow path behind the stables. The hollow clup clup as they crossed the little plank bridge over the stream. It isn't fair, she thought passionately, that only very rich people can afford to own horses. She would cheerfully have wiped every automobile from the face of the earth if only that would bring back the wonderful time when people all had horses of their own. The teacher's voice droned on and on, but Janie was conscious of it only as a persistent buzzing in the distance. Like the large flies that bumbled noisily around the stables she was dreaming about. And finally, the Supreme Court, whose members are appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate, unlike the other judges we have mentioned, these nine men are not called by the title of judge. They are called who can tell the class. His questioning eyes caught Janie's wide, intent gaze. What should we call the members of the Supreme Court? Jane McGregor? Horses, said Jane dreamily. After school, she paused at the door of the girls' locker room. She could hear the story being passed gleefully around by members of her civics class. Peggy's voice arose above the hubbub. Then she looked him right in the eye and said, Horses. Imagine. There were delighted and incredulous streaks. Jane made her way unobserved to her locker. Oh, well, said Carol in an indulgent tone. You know, Janie, she's crazy about horses. Crazy is right, whooped Peggy. Hoof and mouth disease, I call it. Honestly, girls, I'll bet she sleeps standing up and eats out of a nose bag. Every time she opens her mouth, I expect to hear her shinny, or whatever it is that horses do. First thing you know, she'll be looking like a horse. Jane slammed her locker shut and stalked at the door. I'd rather look like a horse than like some people I know, she said. Carol would have walked home with her, but Jane brushed by and strode on alone, kicking at the bright leaves on the sidewalk. It was bad enough, she thought resentfully, not to be able to ride all winter long, or even to see any horses except the junkman's poor, rickety animal. But she couldn't even talk about horses to any of her friends. Either they thought she was bragging about her rich relatives, or they just didn't listen. Except Carol. Good old Carol. And even she had finally said plaintively, Look, let's not talk about horses anymore. I'm scared of horses, sort of. Oh no, Jane had cried. Nobody could be scared of horses. I could, Carol had replied with feeling. I was on a horse once, a horse about a mile high. The ground was so far away I could hardly see it, and my teeth were chattering so loud the old horse turned his head around to see what all the noise was. Then he opened his mouth about a yard and a half. You n- you never saw so many teeth in your life. I couldn't decide whether he was laughing at me or just getting ready to chew my leg off. So I sat there and hollered, Get me down off here, somebody. At home, it was just as bad. Her father, she knew, was proud of her horsemanship. She had heard him bragging to his friends about it. Jane's cousins had been riding all their lives, practically jumped from the cradle into the saddle. But Jane is just about as good on horseback. But even he hadn't the vaguest idea how she felt about horses. To him, riding was just another athletic skill, like playing tennis, and a good horse was no better than a good tennis racket. When she asked for a horse for her birthday, he threw up his hands. It's impossible, he exclaimed. Why do you have any idea what it cost your uncle to keep up that stable? Even aside from the price of a good saddle horse, it would be out of the question for us to keep one. Good heavens, her mother cried in alarm. I should say so. Oh dear, I do think think a horse is so, so, so what, demanded Jane, so large, dear. Well, then, if I can't have a horse for my birthday, I don't want anything. But of course you'll have a party, dear. Why, you've always had a party, and it always been such fun, hadn't it? I don't want any old party, replied Jane sulkily. All I want is a horse. And you'll need a new dress, her mother went on brightly. 
just as if Jane hadn't spoken. I saw the loveliest dress last week in Higger's window. I think it was just your type. It was rather expensive, but as long as it will do for the fall dance, too. The fall dance, Jane echoed blankly. Why, certainly you're going, aren't you? I thought you said Chuck Ryan had asked you. Oh, he asked me all right, mumbled Jane. But I don't know. Honestly, mother, Chuck Ryan is an awful dope. Do you know what he said the other day? He said, horses. Why, I thought the horse was extinct like the dodo. Anyway, I don't want to go to that old fall dance. Really, Jane, began her mother in exasperation. But Jane had fled to the sanctuary of her own room, where she could be alone. At school, she continued to dream her way through classes, doodling little sketches of horses on the margins of her notebooks. One day in geometry, a piece of paper with a horse sketched on it slipped from her desk to the floor. She reached for it quickly, but not quickly enough. The boy across the aisle picked it up, glanced at it casually. Too short in the past term, he commented. To, with scarlet cheeks, Jane snatched the drawing at, at that. Short, short in the past term, indeed. Well, maybe it was at that. At least he hadn't said thick in the ankles, as Chuck Ryan certainly would have. She glanced sideways at him. His name was Grant Davidson, and that was all she knew about him. He was new in school this year. He was tall and gangling, and she had often stumbled over his big feet in the aisle on her way to her seat. But he must know something about horses. She promptly resolved to get acquainted with him. This turned out to be harder than she had anticipated. Every time she ran into him around school, she gave him a smile and a cordial greeting, and every time he, he replied without enthusiasm, Hiya, if only she could catch him outside of school and start a conversation, but she never saw him outside of school. He wasn't in the noisy crowd that descended on the corner drugstore at 3.30. He wasn't out for football, she discovered, by hanging around one afternoon and watching the squad practice. Of course, Chuck, the big oaf, thought she had come to watch him, but that couldn't be helped. She finally came to the conclusion that Grant must have some kind of regular job after school. She asked a few cautious qu questions of people, but somebody seemed to know Grant, but nobody seemed to know Grant Davidson. One morning, about a week before her birthday, she ran into Chuck at the corner and they bicycled to school together. Well, today's the big day, he exclaimed. Jane looked blanked. Say, don't you know what day this is? He demanded. Why, Friday, isn't it? Friday, she says. Listen, dimwit, we play our first game this afternoon and the coach is starting me at right half. How do you like that? Suddenly, Jane remembered the dogged way Chuck had worked to make the team for three years. Oh, how swell, she exclaimed warmly. I'm so glad. And you can just bet I'll be out there this afternoon rooting for you. At a girl, he replied heartily. Say, this is just like old times, isn't it? I knew you were all right all the time, Janie. That's what I kept telling the gang. Janie's off the beam, but it's strictly temporary. A regular gal like Jane McGregor, I kept saying, it stands no reason she isn't going to go on mo mooning forever about something as sissy as riding around on a horse in a pair of fancy pants. I knew you'd snap out of it. Jane's eyes began to flash dangerously, but Chuck blundered happily on. Stick around after the game, huh? We'll go someplace. And remember that date for the fall dance. Jane exploded. Chuck Ryan, don't you ever dare speak to me again as long as you live. Riding horseback isn't sissy. It takes a lot more brains and nerve and skill than kicking a silly old football around and rolling in the mud. I'd rather go riding any day than watch any old football game that was ever played. In fact, I'm not even going to the game this afternoon, so there. And you can just get yourself another date for the fall dance. Chuck's mouth sag op open. But you said... I did not, she snapped. Anyway, I've gotten another date. I'm going with Grant Davidson. As she pedaled on alone toward school, Jane wondered... Now what in the world made me say that? I can't even get a civil hello out of the guy. Fat chance. I have a, of getting an, an invitation to the fall dance.